Tonight's speaker is Michael Pavlovsky. And uh, Michael studied at art under Patrick Carter. And then he attended Texas A&M with a degree in, and he finished with a degree in landscape architecture. And he, uh, he worked for various firms in DFW as the landscape architect. Um, and then he attended uh, the University of North Texas and he earned a master of fine arts degree in sculpture. And he's been a professional sculptor for 30 years. Um, Michael's taught at Tarrant County College. He's affiliated with uh, several galleries in Fort Worth, in Dallas, in New Mexico, and in Arizona. And he does commissions for public uh, art from the cities of Dallas, from Fort Worth, private institutions such as hospitals, churches, and the National Civil Rights Museum in Memphis. And I personally know Michael because he is frequently out at Chandler Gardens doing some maintenance work and some restorative work on a lot of Douglas Chandor's, Chandor's um, um, pieces of art that he has out in the garden, uh, some of the fountains and such. Um, tonight's presentation is called Capturing Nature in Bronze. And Michael's gonna share how he has merged his love for plants with his love for visual arts. And tonight he's gonna be discussing several of his sculpture projects and illustrate how various types of plants in his own garden have had an impact on his style and the character of his sculpture and his paintings. And he's also gonna show some examples of how other artists have been inspired by nature. Um, but Michael, thank you for coming tonight and I'm looking You're forward to your presentation. My pleasure. Should we go ahead and start then? Uh, yes, go ahead and start, thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm going to start with, I'm going to introduce two British uh, botanical illustrators, uh, one from the 19th and 20th century and one from the 20th century. And I want to show you their two uh, varied styles and approaches to uh, their profession of botanical illustration. And then I'll talk about uh, five sculpture projects that uh, I've been involved with and then, and then five paintings um, that I've done and how they kind of have, uh, plant material, various kinds has, have inspired me to, uh, you know, produce the kind of art that I have over the years. This first image, and I'm assuming everybody can see this, uh, this is Arthur Harry Church. He is a very, was a very well-known, and I guess is a very well-known British um, botanic illustrator, and he taught at Oxford University. He was known as a talented and entertaining lecturer. Uh, his specialty was um, he was concerned about plant morpho morphology uh, and the structure and the reproductive mechanisms of plants. And he was known for dissecting plants, uh, flowers, blooms and blossoms, flowers, and um, very meticulously and delicately uh, illustrating those in uh, pen and ink, and I think graphite, and mainly watercolor. In fact, he had produced over 773 watercolors of flowers, uh, and he used these images in his lectures when he taught at Oxford. So he was a, bot a botanist as well as a botanical illustrator, very traditional kind of botanical uh, illustrator. Uh, an interesting thing about his uh, family life, he had three daughters, and uh, he would name their middle names after a plant uh, that was in bloom during the time they were each born. So he, his first daughter was named Audrey, middle name was Althea. Uh, second daughter, Rosemary, middle name, Doronica. And third daughter was Grace, and her middle name was uh, Corilla. I'm not sure, I know what an Althea is, but I'm not sure about those other two plants, but I thought that was an interesting uh, little tidbit about his personal and family life. Um, so uh, what he would do, what he would, let me get on to the next slide here. This picture, by the way, was taken, I would think, around the turn of the last uh, century, maybe in the 1910s or teens. Uh, and let's get to the little arrow. There it is. Uh, this is a book that was written about him uh, in fairly recent times. But um, you can see on the cover of it, uh, one of his wonderful uh, dissected botanical illustrations. And this, I think, is a, um, 
a Japanese quince, if I remember correctly. Um, and you can see how uh, he's kind of taken a razor and what he would do is take a sharp razor in his class during lectures and actually uh, do a cross section, cut a cross section of each blossom. And then um, in his own studio afterwards, he would, uh, after he lectured about it and sometimes before, he would um, very meticulously draw the in, inside workings of the plant as well as the uh, crisp outside uh, beautiful line work along the edges of the blossoms. And that's mainly what he was known for, combining dissected images of plant material with the outer surfaces of the plant. Of the plant. Um, here's another illustration. Um, this is also a Japanese quince, um, Cydonica japonica. And you can see, at least I, I hope you can see, it looks as though someone took a very sharp instrument and did a cross-sectional cut of this uh, flower, uh, especially where the reproduction areas are, the pistil area and the stamen and so forth. But yet around the outside edges, you can see what it would actually look like on the outer surface in real life. So uh, Arthur Church was known for this sort of approach to his botanic uh, illustration. Now, also, if you look at this picture carefully, I think you can see the outside edges of the picture plane. Uh, and what he would do, he was very traditional, uh, unlike the second botanic illustrator that we'll look at in a minute. Uh, he would just simply draw the image of the subject, always uh, flower blossoms, and, and kind of just plop it right down in the center of the picture plane or the composition. Now, this was probably because he was a scientist and he had no formal art training. So he wasn't really too interested in uh, the, the total design of the picture plane or the compositional area. He was just interested in the subject matter at hand, just like a, a traditional good uh, botanic illustrator would be. Okay, so moving on to the next one, this is a violet. Um, and I'll enlarge it for you. And you can see again, even the stem has been dissected, cut, it, cut in half uh, in a cross-sectional type of format. And you can see the inner workings of the reproduction portions of the plant. And even here, this inside edge of the blossom as it goes down. But on this part of it, you can see the outer surface that you would see in real life, the uh, violet and the yellow of the blossoms coming on. And again, this piece is uh, pretty much, it's just about that image, very traditional, no background information, a lot of negative space or leftover space in the compositional uh, area, or as we call it, the picture plane. Uh, this is another one of his, it's a little bit larger. It takes up more of the picture plane than the other ones did. Um, but you can see again, the dissected nature of it in places. And I think it looks like the stem has been dissected and also this petal has been cut and this petal has been cut. So he offers the viewer a look at the inside structure and reproductive elements or components of the plant, as well as the exterior surface color and shape and forms of the plant as well. And I, my understanding is that uh, was kind of a unique thing and he is certainly known for that uh, more than anything else. That is his main contribution. And, and again, he did over 773 of these watercolors. And I think based on what I've been able to find out, the size of these watercolors would be just about the size that you see them on the screen here, generally speaking. Some of course would have been smaller and some would probably have been a little bit larger as well. Okay, this is the second botanic illustrator that I'm going to uh, introduce y'all to tonight. And you may know these two people, I'm not really sure, but hopefully it'll be new information. Uh, this is um, <clears throat> Pandora Sellers, and that's spelled S-E-L-L-A-R-S. -L -L she lived from 1936 to uh, 2017. So she, she just passed away a couple of years ago. And by the way, uh, I neglected to mention that uh, Arthur Harry Church, the previous botanical illustrator and botanist, lived from 1865 to 1937. So back to Pandora, uh, 1936, 2017. 
she was a British uh, botanic illustrator and she was an artist. Now she was trained as an artist, unlike uh, Harry uh, Arthur Church, who was not trained as an artist, just simply as a scientist. Um, she was, uh, Pandora was born in a very rural area of Herefordshire, England, which as you may know, is sort of like in the south central west part of the country. It's very close to the Welsh border. And she was raised uh, growing up loving nature in a very um, wild and rural area, part of Herefordshire in England. Um, she grew up loving nature, so she collected, as a child, she collected impressed wildflowers uh, that she'd found around where she lived, and she began drawing and painting them in watercolor as a small child. So you're probably talking about maybe 12 years old, something like that. So she was enthralled with art and plant material at a you know fairly young age. So guess what? She became an artist and an art teacher. Uh, she went to college and studied art in her town of um, Hereford, England, and I forgot the name of the institution, uh, and became an art teacher. Then eventually she married uh, a man named uh, James Sellers, and he was an artist, a printmaker, and a lecturer. Uh, and they moved to Southampton, England, and lived there for a long time. And then eventually they both retired. But uh, Pandora, and this is another picture of her when she was younger, and I thought it was a beautiful image, so I wanted to include it in this presentation. But Pandora began photographing plants as subject matter for her paintings, and she became frustrated with just simply photographing them and painting from the photographs. Uh, she couldn't get the color that she wanted from the photographs, um, and she just didn't care for that approach. So she began actually painting the plants using watercolor directly. So eventually she became a botanical illustrator. However, unlike her, uh, Arthur Church, her background was an artistically trained background. She had artistic training and that's how she got into the botanic illustration end of things or profession. Unlike uh, Church who was a scientist and began drawing plants for his lectures. Um, now, another thing that is different about these two artists, let's see what's on the next slide here. If I can get to the arrow, ah, here we go. Um, this is Pandora in her studio, probably late middle age. She's working from a drafting table, doing some watercolor. You can see there she's painting some plant image there. Um, in just a second, I'll show you what was unique about her work. Um, this plant is a Arisa Ura candissimum, and I'm not exactly sure what that is, but it's a, I guess it's sort of a, looks like a, an annual type of plant. But what I wanted to show you on this one, this is the beginning of how she kind of departs from the traditional um, botanic illustrators in that She's concerned more about, or as much about, composition and placement of the images as she is with the image, with rendering the image itself. Um, she's got, uh, for example, this kind of focal point, you know, nestled in front of this background of these three leaves. And you can see the leaves, they're highly textured, uh, et cetera, as well as this leaf that's coming out right now, just getting ready to, block, to uh, unfold and beautiful color, very subtle color in places down here. Um, so she's thinking more of total design of the image rather than just simply, you know, rendering a singular image on a piece of paper, let's say. Um, so moving on to the next image. Uh, this, this shows uh, even better what we're talking about where uh, in terms of the total design of the composition, she's using every square inch of that picture plane or that compositional area to compose her painting. There's no negative space around here or very little. There's some up here at the top, which I think she left open just for a little bit of visual relief for the viewer. And I think the size of this, by the way, is about as big as you see it right here, maybe a little bit smaller. But she's, she's responding to, as an artist, to the entire 
uh, compositional area or the entire picture plane. So you've got a nice little focal point there, uh, lots of good line work, very subtle colors, except for the focal point, which is kind of a, a highly saturated color. There's a little bit of negative space that looks like peeping through right there as well as right there. So again, uh, being a uh, traditionally trained artist, she's looking at that entire work as a work of art, as much as, or maybe even more than a botanic illustration. This is another one. This is a very well-known work of hers. Uh, it's called Leila Tenembrosa. It was done in 1989. And look how she's treating the negative space in this picture. She's left negative space around the right and left uh, margins of the composition vertically. Uh, but look how she's treating the edge of this. The, in, the negative space and the positive shapes go in and out among each other. Same thing on this side. And she's cropped the bottom and the top borders of this wonderful drawing or painting. Um, so she's responding to the edges of the picture plane as well as the negative space. So basically she's responding to this entire composition. She's treating it once again, unlike uh, Arthur Church, she's, treating, she's handling and responding to the entire composition. And also she has many <clears throat> different plants in here. This looks like, I don't know, it could be like a philodendron or something. And this of course is a wood fern looking plant uh, more here. <clears throat> this might be an alocasia or something like that. And this is the focal point here in the near upper center of the composition. So artistically, uh, as she was trained, it's a wonderful, wonderful composition. And this was well known because it challenged uh, the conventions of how botanic illustration was done at the time for the reasons we've just talked about. So moving on to another image, uh, this is, um, Oh, it's called the uh, watercolor study of British fungi or fungi, or in other words, mushrooms. And she's again thinking about the entire composition here in that she's got a series of smaller images painted across the top of the composition. And then along the bottom, a series of larger images. And for me, what's most compelling about this composition from a design standpoint is it's vertical balance. And in that, I mean that she's got these weightier, larger, heavier mushrooms or fungi down along the bottom of the composition, which kind of helps to weight it down visually, <clears throat> excuse me. And then the, the upper portion is these images are a little bit lighter. So you have a nice contrast there and a nice sense of, of stability and vertical balance in this composition. And that's uh, Pandora Cellars. <clears throat> She also was uh, very creative and, and very well known. In fact, um, she, there's a quote that says she's universally recognized as one of the most important and influential botanic artists working in the 20th and the 21st century. So, so much so she was well known that uh, somehow they made stamps of some of her botanical illustrations. Now I can't see the titles of these, but some of you may recognize some of these images but the titles are along the left-hand border of each stamp, it looks like. But this just shows you the, the breadth and the fame that she achieved in her lifetime uh, and how talented she was. Also, uh, she, you know, she, this is a piece of China, fine China, and guess what? It's got an image of her botanical illustrations uh, dead center in the bottom of the plate which I think is just wonderful. And I don't know that if she had any, uh, any uh, input in the design of the actual plate itself or just the botanical illustration. My guess is she probably did, but I just wanted to show this to you just to show you, uh, you know, the breadth of her work and how uh, well known and uh, that she was in her lifetime. This is Pandora and her husband, James. And they are sitting atop a mountain in the Black Mountain Range of Herefordshire near where she was raised and where they had lived uh, later in their life. So they look like a wonderful, happy couple. And you can see the, the English background. I think that's looking north, but I'm not sure. The English uh, countryside a bit there. 
<clears throat> so relieving the two botanic illustrators, um, and I wanted to give you some context before I start talking about my uh, sculpture and paintings here. This is my house uh, in Fort Worth, which is where I live. I've lived here since 1982 in Fort Worth. And I wanted to show this to you because um, <clears throat> This, this, uh, this is my front yard. I don't have any grass anywhere on the property. It's a 60 by 120 foot lot. Um, but I've got native plants here for the most part. I've got some uh, yucca rostratas in bloom here, um, some pear cactus along here. Um, I've got some red yucca, hesperolo, parviflora here, and a few other places around. I think there's one back in here somewhere. Um, I've got some Texas sage, Leucophyllum frutescens here, the large variety. And then back here, I've got some the Silverado sage, which is the same species, just a different variety, a dwarf variety. Uh, live oaks here and here. Uh, this is uh, one of my favorite trees, which is the uh, desert willow back here. So I see this every day, and I, it's influenced my work over the years as time has gone by. Um, this is another, just to give you some context again, this is a, a view of my studio several years ago. Uh, not a whole lot going on here at the time, but you can see a small sculpture there of a female figure, um, some little paintings in the background, and there's a drafting table. And um, I've got a window that just came up. This is a equestrian piece that I competed for. Uh, so I've got a nice studio with skylights and it's climate controlled. Um, <clears throat> this is another view inside of it. What you're looking at are clay panels. I use oil-based uh, plastilina clay um, to make my sculptures. And this is a clay panel. And these are two small clay panels or also known as bob reliefs or low reliefs. And in this one, I want to show these to you because you can see some, uh, some tree branches here and cattails right there, and some uh, signature vine work that I have incorporated into my sculpture and paintings. And there's a little bit, I think you can see those vines kind of serpentining around through that clay relief as well. And these were done for, a, or this one was done for a project that we'll talk about here in a little bit. Uh, moving on here, the very first project that I did where I used plant material, plant imagery in my sculpture was for the Veterans Memorial. It's called Coming Home and it uh, was done for the city of Grapevine, Texas. Uh, and this is located in, in the old downtown Grapevine uh, near the railroad uh, depot. And it consists of two parts, uh, the figure and the, the two figures of the uh, military man coming home to a loved one and there's his duffel bag down there. This is primarily meant to be late 20th century uh, military personnel. But what I wanted to show you on this military arch was uh, these cross swords. You can see the sword there and a crossed olive branch. This is better. You can see the sword better here, I think, and then the crossed olive branch. And that represented strength and peace at the time. Uh, but, and down at the bottom, I hope you can see this, is kind of a signature serpentine vine that I use quite a bit in my sculptures and paintings. But this was the first time that I had used it. And in this context, it represented uh, future and hope and uh, regeneration of life. This was done, I think, in about the year 2000 or 2001. And this is an image of that military arch at the bronze foundry under fabrication. And it's being clamped together because when you weld these things together, they tend to twist and warp a little bit because of all the heat. So we clamp these things really tightly and uh, make sure that they're gonna be fabricated just the way they need to be. These lighter uh, horizontal lines are where the welds were and they've been ground down. So these large pieces are typically cast in a number of smaller units. Um, this is a piece that just happens to be at the Fort Worth Botanic Gardens. And I created it for the Garden Club a number of years ago. It's called Birth of Love. And um, 
It is about 11 feet tall, I think, from top to bottom. And it's also a bas relief. And if you look carefully, and I have another image of it, you can see some of that uh, signature vine work happening here, here, and along the top of it, here, and then over here. And this piece was inspired by a couple of uh, uh, earlier artists' work, Botticelli and Michelangelo, two very famous Italian Renaissance artists. Uh, if you look closely at these hands, they're very, the close proximity of the hands and at the hair of this uh, figure right here. And I'll move on to the next slide and you can see where the influence came from. This is Botticelli's uh, uh, um, the birth of Venus, um, a cropped image of it. And you can see how her hair kind of flows in a very lyrical, wild-like fashion. And that's what inspired me to do that very classical female figure that you just saw in The Birth of Love. <clears throat> this is Michelangelo's uh, fresco on the Sistine Chapel. And it, this is a, a detail of the birth of Adam. This is Adam's hand and this is God's hand getting ready to symbolically touch Adam's hand and bring him to life. Um, now, I always start, as I guess all artists do most of the time, we start with a sketch. This was the, it's not a very good image, but it was the original drawing, and it's about 18 inches tall, of the sculpture that you just saw, The Birth of Love. And you can see the female figure here and the male figure in the circle right here. Um, there it is, the seashells down at the bottom. And moving on to the next slide, um, this is the full-size circle done in clay with a wooden armature around it. So there's a half-inch bed of plastiline clay uh, pressed onto this wooden armature. And in the foreground, you can see a cartoon of that drawing that we had just seen. And I, had, I took it down to the copy shop and I had them enlarge it to the exact same size as the full scale sculpture right here. And let's see on the next slide, we have that cartoon's been mounted onto that clay background in the studio. And there I am, uh, I have a wooden knife kind of a tool <clears throat> that I use to incise along, press into a uh, the clay from the front of this cartoon, all of this line work in the drawing so that when that's all pressed into the clay through that paper back, through that paper cartoon, um, I get something like this. And then I go back with a knife and I re-incise for clarity all of the images and lines that were on that uh, original cartoon. So this is the half inch thick bed of clay over top of the circle. These are the incised lines that were transferred via that cartoon. And then down here, I began to uh, kind of smear clay onto the uh, form, that's his arm and that's his hand, uh, to begin to develop the three dimensional um, aspect of the sculpture. And I'm hoping you all can hear all of this. Um, and this is the near complete original plastiline clay bas relief based on that original image right there. It's a little blurry, but you can see what it is. <clears throat> okay. And here we have the finished version, a little bit larger than what we saw earlier. You can see the the two birds, the two figures, uh, that signature vine-like form all the way around most of the most of the composition. The two seashells, two koi fish, uh, three seahorses, and two excuse me scallop shells. And again, that wonderful striated hair, very lyrical, and the proximity of the two hands getting ready to touch. But in this case, they're releasing these two birds into the air. So it's kind of a celebration of the garden and a celebration of life and health, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> this is the other side of that sculpture. And this sculpture was about four inches in depth. And this is about eight and a half feet in diameter. 
but I want to show you the backside of it because all it is is this wonderful serpentine uh, series of vines that kind of serpentine all the way around the uh, entire backside of the sculpture here. And this was done, I think, uh, in the early 2000s for the Garden Club uh, at the Fort Worth Botanic Gardens. This is my backyard picture taken a few years ago. Um, you can see a lot, a lot of plant material, a lot of inspiration, a lot of influence. Uh, by the way, this is a night blooming cirrus that was in bloom at the time. They come to, into bloom during the night and then when the sun comes up, they generally fade pretty quickly, although this one hasn't faded yet. And I've got one back there now that's gotten about 20, had about 20 blooms on it this year already. Um, I wanted to share this with you. It's an amaryllis, wonderful, wonderful, beautiful, um, rich color, just a vibrant flower. I've got a few of those back there. And this, you may know, is a plumeria, pale pink plumeria, uh, also known as a frangipani. I just thought it was a nice image and I wanted to include it. Um, it's got the, I guess the image sort of plopped down like Harry Church's images were, but there is some greenery in the background to complete the composition in the manner of Pandora Cellars. Uh, <clears throat> this is a, a small sculpture that I did for the Moncrief Cancer Institute here in Fort Worth. And it's kind of a, a short free form totem like form with a vessel on top of it or a bowl. And then uh, like a trifoliate sapling or a seedling sort of germinating out from the vessel. And it represents new life and health uh, and that sort of thing for the, uh, and it's in their healing garden uh, at the center. Um, and if you look at this little three leafed form up there, um, I was inspired to do that by these guys. This kind of a trifoliate uh, seedling, and these are plumeria or frangipani that I'm, I was growing in four inch pots. I've grown a bunch of these and sold them at the Botanic Garden sale and show uh, in recent years. But I love this little, just the symmetry of it and everything. So that's what inspired me to uh, create this. This is a close up version of the piece that we had just seen. You can see the vessel or the bowl um, and then this uh, germinating new life, healthy seedling coming out of the top of it. And this is bronze, by the way. Uh, this is another sculpture project that we did for the city of Frisco. And this is out in front of the Frisco City Hall. Um, these are three totems that represent some historical aspect of Frisco. And that historical aspect is um, the three items that put Frisco into existence or put Frisco on the map were agriculture and railroading. And for both of those enterprises, back in the day of steam locomotives, that is, both of those enterprises, you needed water uh, for the steam locomotion, locomotives as and also for the uh, agriculture. And here you can see that uh, trifoliate germinating seedling uh, recurring again in the work. This is a locomotive wheel, and this uh, faceted shape here represents movement or motion. And then this uh, um, kind of serpentine series of lines represents rainwater coming down from the sky. And you can see here these vessels on top of the totems. And these are just free form totems that uh, just kind of happened. I just thought of them and, and kind of came up with this entire uh, tri uh, series of three uh, sculptures. And these are called the Muses of Frisco. So three muses, agriculture, railroading, and water, which basically founded the city of Frisco or the small town of Frisco at the time. Um, and a lot of sculptors, usually we almost always for a commission, a large commission, we have a small scale model. This model is about 12 inches tall. You can see the rainwater symbol. Uh, the germinating seedling. Now the one that I actually used or came up with is a little more spirited. You can see it's a little more uplifted and spirited 
than this guy right here. He looks like he needs some water, actually. And then the railroad symbol or muse is a little bit different. The motion uh, images or form is different than what I ultimately went with. But it's a small scale model typically used to communicate to the client what they're gonna be seeing in the final version. Uh, these are the totems being produced in the studio. I carved these out of a blue styrofoam uh, block like this uh, per those the small models that we just saw. And then I covered them with a skin of plastiline clay, kind of a buff colored clay. So here you can see the three totems in progress. And this one uh, has yet to be covered with clay, the uh, agricultural uh, totem. And here I am in the studio uh, covering one of the vessels with clay. You can see this uh, seedling has been covered with clay. And this is the railroad symbol, railroading symbol, which is going to be covered in clay next. But I think I've got an image next of this uh, seedling uh, being covered in clay. Yeah, here we go. So I'm working the clay into the te surface texture of that blue foam. And then eventually I'll take a sculpture tool and create the desired textural effect um, that I was after. And I thought it was interesting on a couple of these sculptures that you could see the process of, of how they're actually made uh, rather than just showing a series of finished products. Now, uh, molds were made of the totems and they were taken to the bronze foundry. The pieces were cast and welded together and sandblasted. And the next step is to do to provide a, or to create a surface coloration known as a patina uh, on these sandblasted surfaces. And that's done with a, a chemical or two and a, a propane torch. And here we are getting these into position uh, with a winch. Uh, and this is the patina artist that I hired. He's got his torch in his hand. That's the the end of the torch there. And you can't really see the flame because it's kind of invisible. He's got his mask on and then there's the air or the uh, propane line going down to the propane tank, which is off the screen. And he's brushing and heating the surface and brushing uh, cupric nitrate onto the surface to get this wonderful turquoise uh, coloration. Um, and these are the, this is the finished totem taken a couple of years later still look nice. And there's the new city hall building in the background. This is another project that I thought would be interesting to you. This was done, it's a statue of Jesus uh, called Living Water. And it was done for University Christian Church here in Fort Worth. And that's, you may know, is situated right next to uh, TCU and Ed Landreth Hall. And the reason I wanted to show you this, uh, the final version really has nothing to do with plant material, but the way that uh, I arrived, I and the committee arrived at uh, this final version was by considering some concepts relating to plant material. And this is one of the preliminary concept sketches. And you can see I was very much interested in using a vine as symbolism in one of the concepts. And then this is the uh, a vessel, and these are Jesus' hands. And then you can barely see these lines down at the bottom, I hope. And that's the existing pool. Let me go back one slide. This pool was existing. Uh, they renovated this courtyard, did a wonderful job with the renovation of it, redesigned it, and they wanted a sculpture to go in this pool. And eventually I was hired to do this project. So. I went through this process of exploring different concepts. This one was heavily relating to plant material, maybe like uh, some plumeria leaves or maybe a trifoliate germinating seedling. Um, I did a number of these sketches mainly with plant material. Uh, this is another one, again, that three leaf germinating seedling. This is a low, an uh, upper pool, the two hands. This is all in bronze, would have been. And then here is that existing pool in the renovated courtyard that you see here. So the committee and, and I didn't really care for these two plant related or vine related concepts. So <clears throat> and at the same time, I did a third concept, which was this one. And everybody really liked this concept of the statue of Jesus, a small vessel 
and water flowing, running off the edge of the vessel into the existing pool. And I like this concept a lot as well. So um, we went with that and this is what we uh, came up with ultimately. And this is a turquoise, turquoise colored or patinaed bronze. It's a life-size statue. I think it's about five feet, six inches tall. And it's a very unassuming, humble uh, interpretation of Christ. And this is University Drive in the background, by the way. And this is facing uh, the, the church looking west in the courtyard. So when you came out of the church, one of the doors, uh, you, you would see this uh, sculpture. And it was commissioned in memory of one of the parishioners. <clears throat> Now, another sculpture project uh, was uh, I did for the city of Fort Worth. It's called Prairie Wind, and it is a totem, a three-sided totem. You can kind of barely see it here, uh, right here. And then on top of it is a near life-size allegorical figure representing the North Texas prairie. And this was a smaller, similar image of another sculpture, and I wanted to include it in my presentation, which is what you're looking at just so the client could get a better idea of, of what they might be looking at uh, if we went with this presentation. Now this three-sided totem, and let me just, just jump ahead here to the next one. This is the finished piece. And it's, um, oh, maybe like 14 or 15 feet tall, as I remember. Um, <clears throat> it's an allegorical rom romantic figure uh, rep representing uh, the North Texas Prairie, kind of a romantic view of it. She's kind of flowing, her she and her hair are kind of flowing towards downtown Fort Worth. And back to the totem itself, there are three sides to it. So the footprint of it is an equilateral triangle. And let me get back to this other image. So you can see side one, the sky side, side two, the earth or the land side, and side three, the water side. So each of these three sides has in bas relief, uh, low relief, just like the Birth of Love uh, sculpture at the Botanic Gardens, images relating to each of these three themes. For example, in the sky side, you can see a red-tailed hawk, you can see some uh, geese, hummingbird, etc., an owl, uh, and then there's a tree form there. Uh, on the earth or land side, you can see a buffalo, some arrowheads, uh, deer, roadrunner, rabbits, some grasses, and a tree right there, kind of a tree form. I've also got little footprints embossed into the, of maybe raccoons or something embossed into it in various places around. And then you can see the arrowheads as well, which you can find. And then on the skies, on the water side, excuse me, um, I've got some aquatic wildlife, some cattails, and other forms of plant material. You can see fish, little snake, turtles, frogs, etc. So uh, this was the the uh, drawing or the proposal that I did to show the client what they could be, uh, what they would be looking at. And this again is the finished piece. And here we're looking at the sky side, and there's that red-tailed hawk, and there's some geese, and that is probably the moon right there, the hummingbird. Um, and the next slide is <clears throat> just to kind of show you again the process. This is the, the original clay sculpture of that uh, allegorical figure. And you can see it's got uh, some support members holding it up in place. And underneath of this clay is a, a, a kind of a crudely carved blue foam version of the uh, allegorical figure. And this is a painting of a tree of life, that I guess I was doing at that time as well. Um, I wanted to show this image to you because I think it's just a wonderful, beautiful image of this uh, romantic kind of stylized figure gesturing towards downtown Fort Worth. And you can see a close up of it. It's a pretty smooth texture, flowing, kind of rhythmic, uh, lyrical hair. It's not uh, a, de a very detailed figure at all. It's just uh, representational. Um, <clears throat> now we're moving on to my, to the, uh, we're gonna look at five paintings here in a minute, but this is a, 
Henry Matisse. He was a French post-impressionist painter. He lived from, oh, the 1860s, I want to say 1868 to 1954. And this is an image of him in his old age. He uh, raised homing pigeons, and like a lot of artists, he drew and painted what what was his in, in his environment. And here you can see a sketchbook uh, laid out in his lap, and he's got a pencil in his hand. It looks like he's drawing this pigeon right here. And I think he's on a rooftop uh, somewhere. But I was influenced by his work. I just wanted to show you a picture of him because of that. <clears throat> and what I like about his work as it relates to this presentation and Pandora Sellers' work is that he, being a trained artist, would address the entire picture plane just, just as uh, Pandora would. But what I like about his work also, and it's germane to this conversation, is he would use in the background, oftentimes in his paintings, uh, floral images. And you can see this looks like maybe a giant series of giant philodendron leaves or something uh, in the background. So he would use floral imagery a lot to help compose his compositions and to complete his compositions. And this painting, I think it's maybe three feet square, two feet square, somewhat large. It's called Music, and it's an oil on canvas uh, painting done, I think, in the 1930s. Uh, he worked around the time that Picasso did. Uh, they kind of both bridged the 19th and 20th centuries. But I like the way he used plant material in his work to complete the compositions. And I like his work generally, it's very colorful. And um, <clears throat> the next series of images you'll see, you'll see are images that kind of inspire me around my house and garden and so forth. And I've included some of these images in my paintings. This obviously is a, is a little banana tree grove um, that I, I see every day. Um, here are cactus flowers and pear cactus uh, around my place. Um, I see those all the time as well, and I love those things. Just don't like to touch them very much. Um, this is inside my little greenhouse. You can see tropicals, alocasias, um, dracaenas, uh, and so forth. That's a bougainvillea, a crown of thorns down here. So. Uh, these plants, as well as a lot of plumerias around, this is a pretty good size uh, red plumeria. I love the leaves on these things and the structure of the plants. But uh, all of these plants that I've just shown you influence my paintings quite a bit. For example, in this painting, you can see the banana tree-like tree, uh, some agaves, which I have, um, the pear cactus, that signature vine that I use in my sculptures, another pear cactus, uh, palm trees over here, and plumeria leaves kind of filling in this upper portion of the composition up here. So a lot of what I see around my place in terms of plant material is has influenced me in the paintings and, and the sculptures, uh, and, and I incorporate those into the work. This painting is about, it's three feet square. So it's three feet high and three feet wide. So it's kind of a large painting, at least large for me. Um, this is another one very similar, part of that same series. You can see the pear cactus, uh, plumeria leaves, signature vine that I like to draw and sculpt, uh, plumeria flowers on the blouse or the garment, uh, plumeria leaves in the background, banana tree, so a lot going on in terms of plant material there, very stylized and very colorful, like that work of Matisse's that you uh, just recently saw a moment ago. This is also a three foot square painting. Another three foot square painting. Um, I've, I'm still using that uh, trifoliate germinating seedling uh, image along the right hand border of this painting and more sort of abstracted leaf forms down here. Uh, banana trees, palm trees, uh, Italian cypress trees in the background, which I have at my house as well, and the wonderful pear cactus down here. So uh, a lot of influence from the garden here at my house in these paintings. <clears throat> Let's see if we can get to the next one. Uh, a few years back, I was painting a, a several, a number of tree of life paintings, and these are four foot square. So they're 48 inches by 48 inches. 
All the paintings are oil on canvas, very stylized, very colorful. Uh, in that sense, they're kind of similar to Henry Matisse and the color, very similar to Arthur Church and Pandora Sellers' work in terms of the bright colors. There's no crisp edges or anything, but uh, very stylized. But I like the idea of the tree of life, and of course I love the vines and the plant forms. So I did a series of these, and I'm showing two of them to you this evening. This is the second one. Lighter hues, um, brighter uh, or brighter yellow hues and lighter yellow hues, lighter background. But like Pandora's work, the entire composition is addressed uh, with uh, color and shape and so forth. Um, and this one is four foot square as well. And I wanted to share these final two paintings with you because I like them so much and they're very colorful and obviously all about plant material. So that's the end. That was a wonderful presentation, Michael. Thank you, Bill. I really enjoyed it. And yeah, please feel free to ask questions. We do have a, a question about your plant. Somebody is wanting to know uh, sure. whether or not you do anything to protect your plumeria during the winter. Yeah, that's a good question. I do, actually. Um, I've got that greenhouse, which some of the plumeria go in. But I've got, oh, maybe five or six very large ones. And when I say large, they're about eight foot tall, maybe eight, six, eight feet wide in big containers. And I wheel those in with a special dolly into the studio uh, every year. And sometimes we've brought them into the house as well. And if when the house and the studio and the greenhouse get full, I can kind of squeeze one into the back of the van sometimes as well. I'm just kidding about the van comment. But we do have some uh, questions in the chat window here. Uh, we okay. about how long Somebody was asking about how long does it take to develop these sculptures, like, for instance, the birth of love, like, how long did that take to make? Uh, that took about eight or nine months, Bill. Um, and part of the time is working the original, and part of the time is at the foundry. And it's a, it's a production kind of thing when it gets to the foundry, and there's always a deadline. And, um, you know, we, we always bring it in under deadline so far, thankfully. And... I usually give the foundry about, oh, four months minimum to get these larger projects uh, produced. So generally they take eight, the larger ones take eight months to maybe 10 months, let's say. And, and also on that same sculpture, uh, uh, Melinda is asking like, she noticed that, that the hair on the female figure changed somewhat. Uh -huh between the time the, of your first uh, picture of it and your and the final thing. And she was wondering like, how, how, do, how did that uh, develop? Um, I'll tell you what, I didn't mention, that's a very good question. I did not mention the fact that, uh, let me get back to it, that oftentimes between the original concept and the final version, should have done this in PowerPoint, um, things change a little bit as time goes along. And the reason for that, with me at least, is because as an artist and I'm working on it, um, I'm kind of, if it's a commission for a client, I'm kind of, I'm very much obligated to stay within certain boundaries. But oftentimes smaller things like maybe the, uh, you know, the arrangement of the hair and something like that, uh, I'll see a, a different way or maybe be inspired to change that up a little bit as time goes on as I'm working on it. So really it's just a function of me uh, being the artist, uh, seeing a, a different or maybe a more inspirational or satisfying way of rendering some portion of the composition. And that's how things change. And normally what I tell the client is that I always, I want to be able to allow myself to have that well, you could say like a luxury of um, making smaller tweaks and changes as time goes by. Uh, and of course, if it's, if they're paying me, they do, you know, um, then they, they have to kind of approve these modifications. 
you know, and usually we'll have several meetings uh, during the duration of the sculpture uh, production. Um, and what about how do the how, is the foundry where that does these uh, bronzes? Is that where is that located? Well, actually, this one, the Birth of Love at the Fort Worth Botanic Gardens, was cast in the molds were made in here in Fort Worth by Bryant Art Foundry, which used to be in Azel in Reno, actually. And then um, uh, I took the molds up to Santa Fe to Shadoni a bronze foundry uh, in Santa Fe because they were showing my work at the time and I wanted to give them a little business. Uh, and then in recent years, um, the Shadoni foundry closed and then uh, Bryant Fine Art Foundry in Azle, Texas closed. Uh, so in recent years, uh, most artists around go to locally go to a shoot for art bronze in Arlington. And uh, Tommy uh, Ladd is the owner of that. He's a retired firefighter and he's a wonderful foundry man. Uh, very good to deal with, um, very conscientious and very quality oriented. So that's Schaefer Art Bronze in Arlington, Texas. And Schaefer did um, the small piece for the Moncrief Cancer Institute. Uh, they've done a number of pieces for me. Um, they did one of the two one of the three totems for the uh, Muses of Frisco that you saw, and a number of projects. Um, in fact, they're going <clears> to <throat> they're going to do a firefighter statue for me uh, later this year and into next year. And I'm currently working on a, a, a dancer sculpture um, for a client here in Fort Worth, and they're going to cast that for me as well. When you're developing <laughs> the, the the sculptures and you're putting the clay on the forms, do you do you have to a wait a certain long, length of time for those between to build up or well you know uh years ago back in the day of henry matisse and some of those guys let me go back uh they would have they would use uh water-based clay or ceramic clay uh and it would dry out and crack so they had to keep it moist and they could only put you know small amounts on to the framework or armature at a time but with this the newer technology with this oil-based clay, it's a combination of clay, oil, and wax, and something else. It never, ever, ever dries out. So you can put it up there as much on at a time as you want to. You don't have to cover it with plastic or wet rags or anything because it just, it's wonderful. It just never, ever dries out. Now, I don't enjoy sculpting with it as much as I do the water-based clay or the water clay as it's called just because it's, I don't know, it's just a more organic approach to sculpting, I guess. Um, I don't enjoy using this plastiline, this oil this clay as much as I do the water clay, but you can't do large projects, at least I can't, with um, water-based clay. It'd just be too much trouble. You'd put the project at risk and you'd get in trouble, you know, with your client for sure. At least I would. Uh, another question? Um, and I think you might have touched on this a little bit already, but uh, are you working on any, any commissions right now? Yeah, right now I'm working on um, a dancer, a kind of a modern dance figure for a client here in Fort Worth. Um, and I've done some work for him before, uh, him and his wife. Uh, and it's a dancer. She's about... Um, 56 inches tall from the bottom of her feet to the to her raised hand above her head. So that's what I'm currently working on. Then I've got a landscape design that I'm doing for a client. Uh, nothing, you know, very complicated. It's a residential uh, landscape design. And I've, I'm working on the Tarrant County Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Uh, I'm one of the, uh, the designers on, involved with that uh, currently. Where, where will that be located? Uh, that's going to be in uh, along Camp Bowie Boulevard, just a stone's throw from where I live, actually, uh, at um, a small kind of a pocket park between Crestline Road and Camp Bowie. Uh, it's where the headquarters of the original Camp Bowie uh, military base was uh, wow. back in the day, um, you know, 100 some years ago. That makes sense. Yeah, and it's, it's now a veteran's park. 
Uh, and did you um, did you mention where that uh, prairie wind sculpture was uh, located? Uh, no, Bill, I didn't. But where it is, it's in far south Fort Worth in a park called C.P. Hadley Park, and it's almost the Crowley, uh, the city of Crowley boundary. So it's very far south Fort Worth. Um, and if you're driving down the Chisholm Trail Parkway, uh, when you get down further south, uh, you can see it off to the east, uh, off in the distance, see the sculpture, if you know where to look. <laughs> uh, we also have some questions about your uh, plant propagation. Yeah. And uh, well, like wondering where you, uh, where you sell those. Well, you know, I sell them occasionally to uh, just people that I know. Um, I've donated some of the uh, red yuccas to Shandor Gardens uh, a number of years ago. <clears throat> and then, um, but mainly I sell them at the annual uh, Fort Worth Botanic Garden plant show and sale every year. <clears throat> this past year we did it online. Um, and I just simply delivered the plants. Uh, they have various vendors. Some vendors uh, show jewelry, uh, some show plants and different things like that. It's a lot of fun. I really enjoy it. I see people that I know and get to, you know, talk with people. Um, it's just a fun thing for me to do. And the way I got started in raising these plants or growing these plants, I mean, I'm not a nurseryman or anything uh, close to it, but in my landscape, for example, the red yuccas would go to, they produce these seed pods and then the, cat, the pear cactus would, some of those pears would fall off and the agaves would shoot out pups and things. And I just hated to let all this stuff go to waste. So I started, you know, propagating them or planting them as cuttings and, and so forth and seeds. And before I knew it, I had kind of a miniature nursery operation going on behind my studio. <laughs> so... And every year I say I'm going to stop because it's kind of a hassle, but I just enjoy it so much. And so I just keep doing it. It's a lot of fun. Uh, Hi, Michael. Um, can hey. you tell, hey, it's Cindy. Can you tell people when you might be out at the uh, Shandor Gardens again so they can come by and, and look at what you've done? Yeah. Um, I'm scheduled to be out there uh, next month sometime. Let's just say the middle of the month to do some maintenance on the Dragon Fountain and any little bit of restoration work that may be needed. Um, so I'll be out there around the middle of September and that usually takes me about a week to do. I'm out there twice a year doing that. Um, and then next year sometime I'm scheduled, at least tentatively scheduled to restore the moon gate, which I'm looking forward to. So yeah. best bet would be middle of, sept uh, middle of uh, September, yeah. Yeah, yeah I'd love to meet. I'd love to meet some of you all. Yeah, and you actually rebuilt the whole dragon fountain because it was falling apart when uh, when you got to it. Yeah, we did. I did in 2018. Um, you know, we've been talking about it for a number of years and uh, looked at it, and it was just so badly deteriorated that I mean, it was literally crumbling and it become unlevel and. Uh, so I had studied it very, very carefully, took just lots of photographs and drew a lot of diagrams of how it was built. And so I, I totally demolished the original. Um, and then we put in a new foundation, raised it up uh, a foot higher than the original. So the entire fountain was above the water level and totally rebuilt uh, Douglas Shandor's design as closely as I could from scratch using 95% new materials. And I, used, I looked at a lot of original photographs of the fountain and it had changed over the years as well. And I went with an earlier version of the, cent the central middle dome of the fountain, which has, it's now bronze and it has a series of uh, two concentric circles of lotus leaves around it. And then the nozzle is on top of that and the water comes up out of that nozzle. Now, uh, the original fountain was uh, all of the, uh, what are now the bronze pieces, the two dragons and that central dome. I think that's all the bronze on it. Uh, those were originally ceramic, Chinese ceramic pieces. And of course they had deteriorated very badly over the decades. So uh, eventually that was all replaced with bronze versions. 
So on the two dragons, for example, oh, about eight or 10 years ago, I restored those to their original form and then made molds of them and had them cast in bronze. And by the way, the two restored originals are in the uh, studio there, in Douglas's studio, in the uh, vestibule of the studio. So yeah, we, re we I rebuilt that thing from scratch. It took a whole year to do in 2018. Um, and it was the hardest project I think that I've ever done. Just because, you know, Douglas, as an artist, he was out there having fun making this thing out of ceramic pieces and Coke bottles and 7-Up bottles and glass blocks and whatever he could find. And, you know, it, to, an, to a degree, it didn't really matter to him how, how long it lasted, I guess. But, you know, for me, I had to make sure it was going to stay there for a long, long time. So I did a little more engineering and beefed it up a little bit more in places and made made it structurally different than the way Douglas had uh, designed it. But uh, it was a great project. I, I just really enjoyed being out there. I love being out at Shandor Gardens. I like the people. I like the environment, the beauty of it. Uh, it's just a wonderful, wonderful amenity that we have here in the uh, this North Texas region. I love it out there. Well, thank you so much, uh, Michael. That was I. This is just a great presentation. I really enjoyed every. Aspect. Oh, good. Uh, 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 yeah. Well, thank you all for uh, uh, agreeing to have me present this to you. I hope it was, uh, you know, related to your interest. And I know you're all involved in native plant material and so forth. And um, I was just hoping there'd be a connection there for everybody. And uh, just happy to have done it for you. Yeah, thank you for coming out. I appreciate it very much. Um, you are welcome. And I look forward to, yeah, I look forward to seeing you at the gardens again. Thank you. Yeah, me too.